everyone, and welcome to session three of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Randy Henderson, and I am one of the Black Feminist Reading Circle members of this online group. This session runs from January 20th until June 2nd and includes two week long breaks. Our democratically selected reading material is Harriet A. Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Our book group meets each Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 on the Google Plus Hangouts on Air platform. You may find the, Glo the Global Black Feminist Reader Circle on Google Plus, YouTube, and Facebook. And always feel free to join us in reading our story together. Hello everyone and welcome to the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Michelle Oda. I'm one of the co-hosts of the circle and I'm located in Brooklyn, New York. I invite you to learn more about the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle at our main page on Google Plus or on our Facebook group page. Uh, or by visiting YouTube where all of our videos are housed and there are a lot of them. And this session runs through June 16th, so we are coming on down the road. This session we are reading Harriet A. Washington's Medical Apartheid. The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. And tonight we are on Chapter 14, The Machine Age, African American Martyrs to Surgical Technology. And actually, Randy Henderson is going to be moderating tonight, but she won't be here until about 7. Tell, yes. us, who you, tell us who you are. Uh, my name is uh, Joel. I'm calling from, um, hailing you from Charleston, South Carolina. Yes, the infamous North Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you. And Edwina? Um, my name is Edwina, and I'm calling you from um, Utah, the infamous red state of uh the Mormons and the Navajo Indians. <laughs> and you're looking wow. rather cute tonight. And Georgette? I'm Georgette Moses, and I'm participating from Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, and Kim? Hi, I'm Kim, and I'm calling from New York. And I'm Walker, and I'm um, joining you from Connecticut. Welcome. Okay. Hi, my name is Randy. I'm supposed to be moderating tonight. <laughs> but I hope that everybody are, um, is enjoying the question so far. But my name is Randy and I'm watching from Atlanta. Chapter 14, The Machine Age, African American Martyrs to Surgical Technology tells the story of medical experimentation with artificial hearts, artificial blood, and other surgical instruments, and how African Americans tend not to benefit from this research for which their bodies have been used and abused, often without their knowledge or consent, to the same extent as do white Americans. This chapter focused on the lives of patients at the mercy of a bio core doctors and scientists like William Osler Abbott, Hans Zinser, George Gay, and Harry Bailey. The central theme of this chapter was that these corporations, scientists, and doctors alike sought out the use of black bodies for their experiments when, if successful, would not benefit black Americans or be affordable to them. Perhaps the most heart-wrenching aspect of this chapter is that many of the experiments were, of course, unsuccessful. Patients at the mercy 
of a biopore never survived longer than two years. And other black people used by William Osler Abbott, Hans Ginzer, George Gay, and Harry Bailey rarely, if ever, received informed consent. These African Americans were also thought of as animals and were coerced by dreams of profit, life, and sleep to engage in dangerous and fatal experiments. James Quinn was only 52 when he died in 2002, but he had suffered as no man had ever suffered before. No one had ever been implanted with the same version of an experimental artificial heart. No one had suffered his constellations of dread. And I, he was apparently doomed by uh, heart failure within six months. So on November the 5th, his wife Irene said that Quinn had agreed to be implanted with the artificial heart that was intended to make him freely mobile and that was described to him as his last chance at a meaningful life. His surgeon's Dr. Lewis E. Samuels uh, spoke triumphantly of Quinn having lived with his uh, uh, a bio core or uh, artificial heart longer than anyone had expected him nine months. But I really remember James' post surgical experience as a life extended but overrun by pain, disappointment, and despair. Quinn suffered a stroke the very next month that weakened his left side and left him with a tentative um, halting gait. He soon grew unable to walk even short distances. Quinn himself asked about his life with an artificial heart was an unambiguous this is nothing, nothing like I thought it would be. If I had to do it ever again, I wouldn't do it. No, ma'am. I would take my chance on life. James Quinn's administration that he would have done things differently sounds as if he believes some things are worse than death. Initially, uh, would you have made the decision to get the implant or would you have let nature take its course? Run its course. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe that the uh, sciences, sciences um, uh, that were working through um, the, uh, with the, uh, the Ab BioCore Industries did not explain to him fully the um, consequences of this implant and what he uh, uh, should have expect um, in his recovery. I, I, I think they, they were very deceptive. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with Edwina. I think it said in the passage that um, the advocate actually made it seem much better than it was going to be the experience and didn't explain the details. You know, uh, what could happen if things went wrong, and what was the best and worst case scenario, which I think uh, Washington also says is still rampant in experimental surgeries today. So I'd have to say, mm, no, I think I've taken my chance <laughs> with nature. 
because looking at uh, the the terrible quality of life he had after the surgery, how you know they didn't explain to him. You know they they painted a rosy picture for the man and his family instead of being you know straight up with him. Hey, you might have a stroke. You might be debilitated. Lots of things could go wrong. You might bleed out on the table. Even uh, the heart transplants that go on today still have a lot of um, risk involved. So I have to say no. I'm for nature. Yeah, I think I would have taken my wow. chance with um, uh, with nature as well and let nature run its course. Okay. Anybody else? I'm for nature too, Georgette. Let me know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I am too. Um, and I think one of the the main or one of the striking points in that section for me was her point that that patients usually don't understand that research doctors are primarily interested in the research. You know, your survival and the quality of life that you have while you survive is not their main concern. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that's that's how we get deceived. Um, we think when these when these um, exp when when these offers are made to us, you know, we we think that the doctor and the advocate and the company, you know, all understand that if we want to have our life extended, um, you know, we want to be able to live it. 